This is the Lesbian Historic Motif Podcast, brought to you by Heather Rose Jones. The show looks at lesbian and sapphic themes in history and literature, and historical fiction with queer female characters, including fantastic versions of the past. We present research, interviews, news of the field, book listings, and original historical fiction for your enjoyment. For even more historic research, check out our blog, When I became a publisher of other people's fiction, I entered into a new era of firsts. Being an author's first fiction submission. Being an author's first professional sale. And in this case, the first time that I reluctantly declined the first submission of a story and had the author revise to address the story's weaknesses and resubmit it for a successful sale. That won't always be the case. I've also had the experience of receiving a revised submission, and while it was clearly improved, it was edged out by other stories I liked better. But Battling Paul by Rose Cullen had a happy ending because I knew as soon as I started reading the new version that I'd be buying this one. Rosie Cullen is an Irish-born writer based in Manchester in the United Kingdom. She has written for both stage and screen, and her short stories have appeared widely, including in The Copperfield Review and Nix's Mate. Her first novel, a semi-autobiographical family saga, The Lucky Country, was published in 2021. An historical crime fiction novel, Harlequin is Dead, the first in a series set in the London theatre world of the late 18th century, is expected to come out in 2024 from Sapper Books. The short story, Battling Paul, was inspired by a former pugilist of the same name in that novel and reimagines her origins. For more information about Rosie's works, see the link to her blog in the show notes. When we first discussed narration for this story, I hoped to find a narrator who could properly represent the protagonist's identity as a black Londoner of the 18th century. Rosie and others gave me leads on possible voice talent, but alas, none of them worked out. My principle is that if I can't find a good match for a character voice, I'll take on the responsibility of being less than perfect myself, rather than leaving someone else open to criticism for it. So imagine, if you will, that this story is not being narrated by a modern American. This recording is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International Public License. You may share it in the full original form, but you may not sell it, you may not transcribe it, and you may not adapt it. Battling Paul by Rose Cullen The first time I took note of Paul, it was at a hanging. The cart carrying the men to be executed followed its usual route from Newgate to Tyburn to the general entertainment of the crowds in the streets. The highwayman, Dan Steele, a proper murderous villain, was making great play with those he passed, boasting of his exploits and what a fine show he would give at the end, to rousing cheers from his supporters. It was Dan that I had come to bid farewell. The other man, a poor ragged soul, looked about with wide, terrified eyes and could scarce keep upon his feet for the way they were trembling. A great gathering was already assembled and were in jolly humor with all the noise of a fair. Men spilled from the taverns which had opened early, some still inebriated from the night before. Snafflers and scoundrels of every hue wove in amongst the throng. Games of chance were hastily set up. A girl and her ma were shucking oysters. Cries came from the pie sellers and muffin men. A musician struck up his fiddle in anticipation of the jig that would be danced by the condemned men. The Newgate calendar was waved aloft with its lists of the recent hanged, sensational accounts of their lives, their confessions and dying words. I pushed my way forward until I was alongside the cart, and that's when I spotted the two girls. Nancy caught my eye first, a young beauty and no mistake, despite the plainness of her dress and the grubby tears that streamed down her face. I knew at once she must be the quaking man's daughter, come to witness her father's sorry end. She had an arm hooked into a younger girl her sister, a glowering creature who threw dark, scowling looks at all who jostled to peer at them. I am not in the habit of attending hangings, but I felt I owed Dan some due. He had an interest in fighting men, and was amongst the first to sponsor my father's bare-knuckle bouts. Black Sam is now a shadow of the man who held such sway with his fists. 
injured bad about the head in a fight at Marlebone Fields. His wits have never been the same again. It was then that Steele set me on my own career, for I was schooled at my father's knee and knew all the tricks of fighting. What choice did I have? It was either fists or whoring. To be a servant was no choice at all. My father had been sold off a plantation as a boy to play the part of a black page in a grand house, a fashionable accessory then turfed out onto the streets of London when he was grown too big for novelty and too surly. I would serve no one. Whilst men would wager on my fists and I might seize the prize, I would punch and kick my way to infamy. But I must look to my future, never more so. My benefactor about to take his final exit, dancing a jig on the fatal tree. He caught sight of me from the jolting cart and waved his hat with a flourish. Jane, my savage beauty, come to bid old Dan farewell? I nodded up to him with a grin. And to pray for your wicked soul, sir. He laughed uproariously. The devil shall have to catch me first. He turned to his supporters. Isn't that right, lads? There was a great roar of approval from the crowd. The cart drew up at Tyburn. I could see the liquid gleam in Dan's eye. He was well in his cups, his supporters plying him with toasts, and he full of banter and boasts. He knew his end was upon him, but he should live on in legend and in song, and he would cock a snook at death. The other man was dragged from the cart by the guards and made a great cry and wail of his innocence. The crowd jeered, for no man is innocent and may as well hang for one thing as another. An apprentice lad pointed. His high-pitched hoot rang above the general noise. That milksop has pissed and shat himself and not yet on the tree. At which the younger daughter leapt forward and set about the boy with her fists. They flew in a furious shower of pummeling, and the fellow, though head taller and raising his arms in defense, was tipped onto his arse. He had such a look of astonishment as to be quite comical. The older sister rushed to restrain her sibling. Paul, come away. I could see that the apprentice did not much relish being the butt of his companion's jokes. There was a blazing cast to his eyes as he found his feet again in the dirt. Straight away I sensed he was the sort of tyke that would not have his pride bested by any woman, never mind a chit of a girl. Young Paul had been yanked by her sister, but this lad would have the last blow. His fist was raised and clenched. I could see his intent and yelled a warning. Paul swung about, dodging under his assault, and her eyes blazing in turn dealt the lummox a singeing blow square on the chin. He staggered back into the arms of his brothers, who clapped him soundly and dragged him away. One lad winking at Nancy as they withdrew. Your sister's a fiery minx, ain't she? Tis a pity your pa does not have some of her stomach. I was minded to think the same. As she had grabbed my attention, so had a notion that I might set up a school for female pugilists. Some find hangings a great diversion, their own lives being so paltry. In watching another die, they may feel for an instance that they have the great good fortune to be alive. I was thankful that Dan's end was made quick. He had paid this Jack Ketch well enough for the execution of his job. The girl's father was not so blessed. It was upwards of twenty minutes before he twitched his last. The girls were led away by a thin, pockmarked man I had not much noticed before. I must act swiftly on the idea which had begun to take shape in my mind, and rushed to stand in their path. Them's handy fists, I directed to Paul. I might have a use for them fists. Pardon, if you please, Nancy made to pass. I could train you up. I kept hold of Paul's eye and saw the interest there. To what? the girl asked. A bruiser like me? Away, Blackie, the man glowered. I remained fixed on Paul. Think on it. Where's your diggings? Did you not hear me, strumpet? Make way, the man snarled. I took note of him then, his pinched mien. He was a man well past his prime, lank gray hair straggling from beneath his tricorn, but the cut of his cloth was fine enough. I'm no hedge whore, and you shan't be neither, Paul. By the blue boar in St. Giles, Paul threw back over her shoulder. I nodded and smiled slowly. Paul was not so pretty as her sister, but I could feel a quickening of my heart toward her. A school for female pugilists. The idea took root in my breast. There should always be an interest in that spectacle since the days of the champion Eliza Wilkinson, even if only as a sideshow. I had seen women slide into the fighting life through gin-addled desperation, a sideline to their harlotry thinking nothing of burying their breasts as part of the attraction. 
but I had fought for my own glory, saved my prize monies, and had a mind to make a respectable retirement, never having met a man I liked in the marrying kind of way. I had no need of a husband's protection, and besides, I still had the care of my father. Black Sam could help in the training. His wits would allow of that. This girl, Paul, should be the start of my establishment. My fancy is raced ahead. We might even one day be partners and share the enterprise together. Two days later, I found where the girls were lodged and more in addition. Pretty little Nancy worked at her needle, mending dresses for the second-hand clothes trade. Paul had fetched up slaving for a washerwoman. Turning the great mangle to wring the sheets had developed her muscles, I hazarded. The money that the girls earned scarce enough to keep the dismal roof above their heads now that their father was no more. They should be in need of some assistance. That was soon apparent as I approached their mean cellar. Nancy stood below with the narrow door, and a bod was on the step above, decked out in her frippery. Mistress Knowles has sent me to fetch you if you're willing, the bod sniffed. To help keep house, mend, and shift. It'll be your board, and keep, and more besides if you're minded and show willing. Nancy looked hesitant and covetous of the pink and purple gown with its trim of lace. But then a hand was laid on Nancy's shoulder and drew her back within. In her place stood the thin, wiry man. Get away with your devilish business. You are not welcome here. The harlot bridled. You have your chance, Nancy Treadle, she called down to the girl now out of sight. Better than an old goat like this reeky pox-marked moldwarp. Then flounced up the step and passed me with a huff. The door Sam shut behind her. I paused. Was now a good time to speak with the girls? It seemed the vultures were already circling. I had learned that this old goat was Mr. Isaac Gridley. He had a shop of second-hand clothes, and Nancy was one of the needle girls mending the better class of garment that wanted a stitch or two. Was his interest in her welfare simple philanthropy? I doubted it very much. That hand on the shoulder had spoken of possession in more ways than one. Mr. Gridley should be a veritable guard-dog now that he had such a delectable prize within his grasp. It turned my stomach to think of his thin, mean claws pawing at Nancy's young, ripe flesh, his pitted snout nestled in her blossoming buds. Well, I would not think on that. It was that game-bird Paul that I had come for, with or without Nancy. The man on the corner was casting a cutty eye in my direction. I did not like the look of the rogue. Pa had taught me from the earliest age to have a half-eye for them that might want to blackbird me onto some ship at Deptford, bound for the West Indies. He was born a slave, and wanted no child of his to suffer that fate. My mother had been a scullery maid from Kent, dead long years past from a coughing fever. My lighter coloring only added to the threat. I found the little clasp knife I kept in my pocket and gripped the handle for reassurance, at the same time shooting the cove a sharp look to signal that I had his measure. He slunk away into the alley behind. To business. I stepped down to the poor mean dwelling with fresh purpose. You think our Paul can earn that kind of money? She's got the guts for it, I asserted. And have her teeth knocked out, most like, along with her brains. Then where's her prospects? Nancy cast a worried glance at her younger sister. Paul had passed me a shy look as she held the door wide. I made a bold entrance to the miserable room, which the young Treadles called home. I had come with a fair proposition, I declared. When Isaac Gridley attempted to interject, I made it clear that my business was not with him, and I would not be put out of the door until I had been heard. Paul leapt forward with Gridley's hat, accompanied by a swift curtsy. Good day, Mr. Gridley. You was just taking your leave, was you not, sir? The shopkeeper scowled, but bowed in turn, and bade farewell to Nancy, promising to return on the morrow for her answer. I'd train you up, I addressed Paul direct. Paul has employment. Stirring the great copper and mangling sheets, I know, and her hands will cripple with chillblains and her back bend double under that labor. It is honest work. And so is mine. I am no trickster or deceiver, I pushed advantage. I'd take a cut, mind, be like her manager. My father is Black Sam and a noted champion. We're starting a proper school. There'd be a small room and mat, no rent for the present. My heart was in my mouth, looking between the two girls. Nancy paused, her girlish features twisted in an agony of uncertainty. I have an offer of marriage. Paul may come and keep house for Mr. Gridley. That is the promise. So the old lecher had wasted no time in courting the young beauty, and would make a skivvy out of Paul. And what does Paul want? Paul wanted for us to stay together, Nancy answered, the shape of her decision made. 
Pa's dead. Paul took a step forward. At that, Nancy slapped her quick and hard on the cheek, then clasped her mouth, a sob rising in her throat. Paul nursed her reddened cheek and hung her head. I sighed. I will wish you well of your nuptials then, Nancy Treadle, and bid you both good day. Day had fast turned to dusk when I emerged, the narrow derelict streets of the rookery already deep in shadow. A link boy stood about, trimming his wick. I pulled my shawl tight and took my bearings. A dog crept by and licked my shoe. I could take a shortcut from the end of the street. That would bring me quicker to Holborn. I turned into a ginnel that led through a fetid courtyard where an old crone sat on a step and reached out a hand for alms. But my mind was still playing over the scene in the cellar. A missed opportunity. I had felt sure young Paul would have taken my hand then and there and brought her sister round to it if it were not for Mr. Gridley's various proposals. With my thoughts so distracted, I failed to notice the figures looming out of the darkness from behind until one had grasped me by the arm whilst the other attempted to put a burlap over my head. My wits were slow, but my instincts were not. I squirmed about and kneed out sharp to the man with the sack. He grunted. With my free hand, I grappled for the knife in my pocket whilst I tried to wrestle free of restraint. A blow rained down on my head, the force of which shot through my spine. I staggered, but was still on my feet and the knife in hand. Then, in a moment, all was black as the sack slipped over my head. I lashed out with the blade and caught one of my assailants. He cried out in a shocked agony and released my arm. God's teeth! Seize the bitch! the man cried. I leapt back, groping for the sacking that blinded me. My ears were thrumming from the blow, but I heard steps running towards the yard. The old crone crackled. And then I heard the thud of an object hitting one of my attackers and his sharp cry. I yanked the burlap from my head in time to see a cobble flying towards the second man and hitting him square at the back of his thick skull. My would-be kidnappers had had their fill and with a flurry of oaths made haste away. I caught at my breath, my thanks, and turned to find young Paul emerge from the ginnel. I saw them coves follow you. I guessed what they might be about and run to warn you. And very grateful I am, Paul. You'd have stuck em anyways. You have good aim. That's another fair attribute. Paul shrugged, but even in the dimming light I could see a blush rise up her cheeks. Again, my thanks. I told Nance she must let me give it one chance. Paul scuffed her clogs. That is why I follow. She has agreed? She will not stop me when I'm set. There was a sudden steel in her eye. I nodded. The girl had grit, and plenty of it. We'll start tomorrow, then. Paul arrived in the afternoon, having quit the washerwoman and packed up a bag of scant possessions. Nance ain't happy, says Mr. Gridley won't be neither. He would make a slave of you, both of you. Paul nodded. Nance only thinks to be respectable, but there's more than one way, and no need to marry that old curmudgeon. She thinks she will have the pick of all his dresses and make herself a very fine lady. Paul grunted. You're not married, then? She cast a sly glance at me. I held her gaze. I am not so inclined. And besides, a husband might put his feet up and should drink all my winnings. Paul grinned. You're right there. Only with us it was our ma got the taste for gin. It did for her. Pa was the one kept us neat. Her eyes narrowed. Now he is hung and some rat faint taken the reward, the same that planted them stolen goods, I shouldn't wonder. Ah, is that the story? A common enough tale? So, you will put me to work? Straight away. Over the succeeding days, Paul was made to exercise her muscles in a dozen new ways. I had her jumping up and down as though she were a rabbit bouncing across the yard. My father would hold a heavy canvas bag that was slung up in the yard, and she must hit at it as hard as she could for hours on end, Black Sam encouraging and goading her along. In the evening, she could scarce bear the throbbing pain and the scrapes across her fists from the rough canvas. I rubbed a mixture of boiled water and vinegar, stinging into any cuts. Then I would apply a poultice of honey to take down the swelling and inflammation in her hands, murmuring soothing words all the while she is gritting her teeth and trying to blink back the exhaustion which assailed her. You miss the mangle then, Paul? I jested. The girl shook her head vigorously. I ain't quittin'. I knew you was a rum one. Good girl. Them fists are hardening nicely. Knuckles calloused. And your wrists. You can feel it, can't you? Paul nodded. They can take more of the pummeling. I can tell. Rest up tomorrow, and then the day after you'll see your first opponent. Paul looked up sharp. 
Bess Bamber. She's fighting down in Wimbledon Fields. Against no one of consequence. But you shall see what Bess can do, and you will remember when you comes up against her. We'll lay the challenge whilst we're there. I'm thinking, end of May, you'll be ready for your first outing. If you still the stomach for it. It was a fine day for the time of year, and a lively crowd were gathered in Wimbledon for the sport. I could feel Paul afire and twitching beside me with a nervous energy, eyes darting every which way as she took in all the business, the ceremony, the etiquette. Bess's opponent was a poorly prepared scrapper, but the woman put up a brave show, and the rounds went on well past the hour. Later, as we scrambled back onto the cart I had borrowed, I prodded Paul. So, what did you take note of? Paul thought a moment. I thought Bess would aim for the face with every blow, but instead she laid about the body. I nodded. You're slugging bone on bone, see, aiming for the head. That's a lot of cutting in blood on hands and face. You hit the body, can hurt just as much and less damage to the fists. Pick your moment, see, when you come in with a jab to the chin or a side blow to the skull. I've seen that. Still, plenty blood. There will always be blood. That's what the audience comes for. And that girl looked half-blinded by the end. Swelling round the eyes always looks bad. The other girl was swinging, but Bess is dodging. That's right. You got to duck and dive, too, my pretty, if you want to keep them good looks of yours. Paul was silent. I laid a hand on her knee. Now you've seen it close. Fighting might not be to your fancy no more. I don't hold you to nothing, Paul. The challenge? Bess would fight me in your stead. Makes no matter. Paul tightened her lips and then grasped my hand. I am determined. I squeezed her hand in turn and liked the feel of it in mine, a good, honest hand. I thrilled that she let it rest and did not pull away. Paul cast a sidelong look with an impudent smirk. And besides, you have not lost your good looks, Miss Black, for all your fighting years. I shall trust in your training to keep mine, too. And I will have a care, Paul, I promise you that. She may not be as pretty as her sister, but Paul's looks had quite crept up and stolen my fancy. You must learn to lead with the first two knuckles. That way you will not damage your hand so much, and you may strike with greater accuracy. Her hand remained clasped in mine, all the drive back to Southwark, as we jostled up close together. A location for the bout was fixed at Marlebone. Post bills printed, the announcement of the challenge appeared in the London Daily Post. A note arrived to inform Paul that the first Sunday of the marriage bands had been called for Mr. Isaac Bridley and Miss Anne Treadle. The ceremony should take place at the beginning of June, after the prescribed third Sunday. Nance hoped that Paul would join her, and then afterwards take up residence in Mr. Gridley's house. She was grateful that Mr. Gridley was still so kindly disposed towards Paul. Paul replied, informing her sister of the date and venue of the challenge. You read and write, I remarked. A little. My hand is not so fine as Nance. Our pa taught us. It is a useful skill for affairs of business. Should you like me to teach you? We may make fair exchange. I see I shall have to have a care, Paul Treadle, or it is you shall have the management of me. She smiled at that, as though the notion pleased her. That night, I offered her a share of the comforts of my bed, and we made a regular and cozy fit of ourselves. Broughton's rules were agreed. There should be no grabbing below the waist. A round should last until one or the other pugilist went down, but they should then have to square off in the count of thirty. An opponent was not to be hit when they were down. There would be no hair-pulling or eye-gouging. To ensure this last, both parties agreed to hold a half-crown in each hand, and the first to drop their coin should lose the battle. Bess had been reluctant to this condition but persuaded at the last that they would attract a more sporting crowd and larger stakes if they could show that female bruisers were of as professional demeanor as Mr. Jack Broughton. The noise and hubbub of the gathered spectators rose to greet us as I brought Paul to her corner. She was dressed in a simple skirt and plain chemise, but I had strapped her breasts for modesty and safety. I could tell that Paul was glad of this when we caught sight of Nancy on the arm of Mr. Gridley. It vexed me to see Nancy so openly displayed by the lecherous villain. For villain he was, of that I had no doubts, despite my lack of proofs. The more I thought on the hanging of Robert Treadle and the consequences for his daughters, the more I was convinced that Gridley had played a part in it. But I must keep mum or sour all relations. 
Bess Bamber arrived at the scratch looking mean and tough, flexing her muscles and with her fists up like a good boxer, believing she had the prize already. I patted my apprentice on the back. Go to it, Paul. Paul took up her position, and the signal was given. At once, Bess launched in ready to jab and punch the green stripling. But to the surprise and delight of the audience, Paul started to jump about, bouncing like a rabbit. Bess frowned in confusion, throwing punches, but they're hitting air, and the next thing, Paul has caught her on the side of her jaw, a blow like a hammer. Bess is shaken, but steadies and jabs back and moves around in a tight circle, as Paul comes around and about, every so often darting in with a mean jab. I had to stop myself from laughing out loud. Paul was playing her own game against a seasoned opponent. But oh, how glorious it was if only she could keep it up. A rising hum and buzz rippled through the crowd. Paul might not have the weight advantage, but whenever she lands a punch, it's on target and doing plenty of damage. But Bess was following her now, keeping her eyes trained. All at once she leapt in at Paul from underneath, catching her a fierce blow. Paul staggered and fell back, losing balance, and then she was down. How quickly fortune could shift. I felt the blow as though it had landed on my own chin, and it was all I could do not to rush forward and take Paul in my arms. Come on, Paul, I urged under my breath. The crowd were jeering now. They did not want so quick a defeat. Paul scrambled back up onto her feet to present it at the scratch. Fists clenched, determined not to lose her coins. The round is called, and each returned to their second. I could sense that Paul was mad with herself. You must not underestimate Bess, I hissed in her ear. She is dangerous, but so are you. You can prevail. Paul gave a curt nod. She was more cautious now, still leapt about, but also kept her defenses up. And then she met the mark I had proposed, opening an old scar above the left eye. A ripe excitement exploded in the chants and shouts from the sporting crowd. They scented blood, and sure enough, it was trickling down the side of Bess's cheek. All at once, Bess attacked with a ferocious burst of punches, one landing square on Paul's jaw. My girl slid to the ground, and this time it took all her effort to regain her feet. I pushed a tankard of small beer between her lips. You do not have to go on. You have done enough. Paul shook her head and pressed back into the bout. Both fighters are tired now, and once or twice they fall into a clumsy embrace, Paul's head lolling to one side. I felt every blow and would trade places in an instant. Bess came in again, but Paul anticipated and sidestepped at the last, swung about, and jabbed her sharp on the nose. Moments later, there's a smear of blood. Paul swerved again and penetrated the falling defenses with a singeing upper cut which lifted Bess right off her feet. The old bruiser crumpled to the floor, never to find those feet again, two half-crowns rattling to the ground beside her. In the general hullabaloo, Nancy rushed to her sister's side. Paul! Dearest Paul, you are injured! You have had this chance, foolish girl. You must come home to me now. It's all right, Nance. I shall be all right. I will look after you. Come away with me now. Paul shook her head. You cannot want this for your life, Nance insisted. That's for Paul to decide, I cut in. Come, Nancy, tarry no more. Isaac gripped her arm. Leave your sister to her filthy trade if she will not see what is right and proper. Nancy, do you not see? I have won the prize. I've done it for you, and I shall win again. You do not need to marry this man. What do you say? Nancy was all confusion. Paul looked quickly to me. You are most welcome to come to us, Nancy. Nancy stepped back. No, I am to be Mrs. Gridley, wife to an honest merchant. You ask me to forsake all that? For what? I cannot, Paul. The two sisters stared at each other a long moment until Nancy allowed herself to be led away. I could see a tear edged up over Paul's swollen eyelid. I thought to save her from him. I have lost you a sister. I'm sorry for it. I placed a hand on her shoulder. Paul regarded me keenly from bruised and battered face. But I have found another. Then she let herself fall into my arms, and I took her home. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of the Lesbian Historic Motif podcast. See the show notes for links to people and topics. Most shows will have a transcript linked as well. If you have a book announcement, a topic suggestion, or might like to appear on the show, please drop me an email. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate it and subscribe on your favorite podcast app, and consider supporting our Patreon.